liquidity. And um, so we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Again, just to refresh, the farm economy has turned um, quite dramatically um, negative in the last two years. Um, based upon what current price expectations are, and again, um, I don't believe the forecast of $4 corn um, for the next three years, that's kind of the expectation now. It'll either be higher or it'll be lower, simply because something will change in the world to um, cause you to adapt, and in some respects, I think that's probably one of the keys is as you think about managing, you kind of have to manage for adaption. And right now you're probably looking more at uh, the negative side, the lower tail, to make sure that uh, you are positioned when um, the, uh, the um, farm economy um, changes. Um, and so that's what we're gonna spend a little bit of time on, how do you position your farm to perhaps um, deal with some difficult times such that when the uh, um, prices um, change and uh, the demand um, increases, um, you'll be ready to uh, take hold of that. One of the key things I think that's really important to focus on is liquidity. Um, liquidity basically is um, how well or how much wherewithal do you have to pay um, your expenses in the next year. There's a number of ways that it's measured and we'll kind of look at some information, but uh, there's a current ratio, there's a working capital, there's a, a two working capital percentage type ratios. One is a function of income, one is a function of assets. They all tell you a little bit about uh, roughly the same type of thing, but they're looking at it um, a little bit differently. And hopefully, um, as you think about your own farm operation, it's really important to think about where you are but then to begin to look at, okay, where, based on where am I now, where might I be in two or three years under the situation? Simply because if you know that you're going to have a situation to deal with in two or three years, if conditions don't change, it gives you more time to plan for it. And many times it gives you more time to make better decisions. And so in some respects, what we're gonna talk about here is, is thinking a little bit longer term. But first, to give you a little bit of information with regards to the ratios, in terms of the uh, um, first ratio here um, that you've probably heard of is the current asset ratio, or a current ratio, it's just divided by your current assets and current liabilities. And so current assets, just to review, are anything that you expect to sell in the next year and current liabilities or anything that you expect to have to pay for in the next year. You take current assets divided by current liabilities. Um, usually a higher number is good, a lower number is bad, although it is possible that you can have too high a current ratio, um, simply because current assets typically don't earn a lot of money. For example, one current asset is cash. How much interest do you get on cash? virtually nothing. And so having a million dollars in your bank account sitting in a non-interest bearing account, it's gonna give you a good liquidity position, but probably not the best management situation. In terms of looking at that, where we've been since 2008, um, we went from 1.94 to 2.51. Um, and then um, from 2012, it turned. Um, and now we're back to 1.94. So in some respects, the current ratio is about where we are um, when um, we began this, this cycle. Another way to look at this, and you're using the exact same numbers, but instead of looking at it in a ratio, you look at it in terms of dollar terms. Um, and so what you end up doing is just taking current assets minus current liabilities. This is known as working capital or net working capital. A lot of people always talk about working capital. Um, to look at where we were, we went from 142,000 um, all the way up to 298,000 in 2014. And um, from 2014 to 2015, um, we reduced our working capital by roughly 42,000. And so that's a fairly negative um, type, type situation. Part of the numbers, reasons they went, is the average farm size and the average um, scale of farms in Kansas has kind of grown over time, so part of that's occurring. But one of the ways you can kind of think about this working capital number is most producer 
uh, end up with a situation where they pay out a lot of expenses at the beginning of the year, and then they have the income six, nine months later. And so in some respects, from a dollar perspective, where you can think about this working capital is, is how much money do I need to go from crop to crop in terms of what is kind of the cash that I need to get me through until where, where I am. And so in, in some respects, sometimes if you look at kind of the budgeting, one of the ways to think about how much working capital should I have is thinking through how much money do I need from year to year or income to income, realizing that uh, um, income is, is very, very lumpy. You can also then begin to, um, to, to look at this. Um, um, again, this just gives the ability to cover current expenses with liquid assets. Um, although a lot of times in order to compare across operations, they usually end up dividing it by gross revenue or assets to try to get it scale neutral. If you look at it in terms of uh, working capital divided by assets, um, essentially, um, you see that we actually peaked in 2009, and we've actually been carrying less working capital over time. Um, it's moved from about 10.8% all the way down to 8%. And then uh, the other one that you'll see, and this one is very misleading um, in this situation, simply because if you divide it by um, gross farm income, gross farm income has fallen faster than your working capital has. And so it actually looks like you're in a stronger position here when you're actually not um, in terms of, and so you have to be a little bit careful um, with these ratios. But what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna kind of go through a little bit of a spreadsheet example here. And this uh, spreadsheet is available on, on Egg Manager. And in some respects, um, you can actually put in kind of some of your own numbers there. In terms of the blue numbers, are basically, would be your actual farm numbers. And then the green numbers would be kind of assumptions that you would end up making. But a lot of my assumptions are just gonna be based off um, what I calculated or my own numbers. For example, in order to get costs um, of this 90%, roughly I just took 502 divided by 558. And then I just rounded it up in order to get 90% um, in terms of I kind of like working in round numbers as opposed to thousands of decimals. Um, depreciation, this was the actual depreciation uh, on this farm um, for 2015. And then I just divide that by my uh, fixed assets. And so that kind of is where that 3% came from. Um, the interest, essentially I just took my interest um, divided by um, my debt in order to come up kind of with a 5%, or if you kind of know what an average interest rate is on there. Um, tax rate, I just made an assumption. And then the other thing that here I ended up using is a dividend. And you're gonna say, well, wait, my farm doesn't pay dividends. Yeah, your farm does pay dividends. If you spend anything out to live on, that's your dividend. And so sometimes, for example, people will talk about a dividend policy and people that have proprietorships will just check out and say, it's not appropriate for me. Yes, it is. Every firm has a dividend policy. You just call it by a different name. The way we call about it is family living. And so your family living is actually your dividend policy in terms of how much you're withdrawing from a family living perspective is actually a dividend policy. And a dividend is going to affect company goals or farm goals in terms of the higher dividend you pay, the slower you're gonna be able to grow your operation. The lower dividend you pay, the quicker you're gonna um, be able to grow your operation, but there's also some costs from having a very low dividend in terms of the rest of your family um, may not eat like eating like a college student. And so uh, um, there's uh, um, kind of a trade-off there. Um, and so that's kind of how you set this up in terms of just to give you kind of a scale. And this is kind of the average uh, Kansas Fam Farm Management Association farm, where in 2015, they had about 560,000 in revenue, um, 502,000 in cost, 65,000 in depreciation. Um, EBIT here is basically just uh, um, income minus your cost and depreciation. 
That gives you, in this case, a negative 9,000. Um, ended up having another 21,000 in interest. Um, that ends up uh, giving you um, um, a tax if you just take 15% of that. And this is a negative number, and, and, and people will argue, well, okay, it's a negative number. Well, um, there's a couple ways you can do that. If you have non-farm income, basically the loss you have on your farming operation will set aside some of that. Or um, with careful tax planning, there'll be a session looking at that. That tax loss you can actually carry over to offset income in past years or future years, um, um, given, given the uh, current... Uh, um, tax tax laws. And so basically that ends up giving us, a, in this case, a negative net farm income of uh, 26000 And then what I ended up adding back is your depreciation. Um, you never write out a check for depreciation, and so your checkbook looks like um, you had a positive $40,000 in, in operating. Current assets, $527,000. Uh, of that, uh, current liabilities here were $271,000. You subtract those two numbers to get the net working capital, which is 255,000. Um, assets, fixed assets, this would be your machinery, equipment, um, land, um, any breeding cattle of uh, 2.1 uh, million. Total assets of 2.6 million, long-term debt 412,000. Um, take that, minus the 412 is you get the uh, 1 million, 1. Or roughly two million, and uh, you're, this has to add up. Then the bottom here, you're looking at okay. Um, I'm assuming here that we're going to reinvest the depreciation, and that's something you may want to consider or not. But essentially, what this says is, the stuff wears out, I have to replace it, and that's kind of a decision you end up making, and it's a decision you can probably make in in the short term here in terms of whether or not you want to uh, continue to do that or not. And then we have the uh, family living assumption here. And uh, this is probably a little bit high. I think the average in Kansas last year was about 53,000. Although for 2014, um, it was probably 61, 62,000. So what then I've done is just say, okay, based on Michael's forecast, and so if you don't like the forecast, they're all Michael's. And uh, essentially, I'm just going to assume that Michael is right for each of the year, each year for the next four years. So, so essentially, what she ends up assuming is going to happen over the next four years is going to happen on this operation, and we're going to see where this operation is. One of the first things you begin to look at here is what's happened to our current liabilities. If I don't do anything and just kind of say, you know, 2015 was 2015, and repeated it in 2016. I'm going to continue it in 2017. I'm just going to farm the way that I've always farmed. Can you continue to do that for two, three years? Do you think your banker would be happy taking your current liabilities from 271,000 to 612,000? I don't think your banker would be too happy with you coming in each year and saying, you know, farming was tough, but you're going to help me out. You're going to give me another 80000 Kind of repeat that over two or three years, and all of a sudden your banker's going to say, I don't think so. And so in some respects here, we see a situation, and this in some respects is reflected in this working capital situation going from about 255000 down to 85,000, negative. And so again, it's a situation, if we look at our total debt to asset ratio, we're taking our debt to asset ratio of about 25.5% to 38%. And so again, if we just continue, and if we have a repeat of where we are from an income perspective, the next two or three years, we're gonna put on quite a bit of debt with, with where we are. In terms of you could say, well, this may be doable in terms of uh, Dr. Featherstone said that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the average was 35, 36%, so 38%. Well, it's a little bit more debt to asset ratio, and so we may be able to manage it. And 
that may be a true statement. And in some respects, it's going to be a whole lot easier to manage now, especially if we manage our interest rate policy, because interest rates are pretty low. We're paying maybe five, four, six percent for credit, as opposed to 10, 11, 8 percent, 7 percent. But certainly, if you see the operation is going that way, that you're going to be taking on a lot more debt, I certainly wouldn't take it on the current liability side. I would begin to say, you know, I don't want to be susceptible to macroeconomic consequences. I might want to fix some of this interest rate. But given this, how are you going to fix this? Your operations, so how are we going to fix this? This is a spreadsheet, and so we can begin to look at at fixes. Thoughts? Because this is some of the exercises I think you're probably going to want to go through on your own operation in terms of thinking it. Like to me what I would do is um, plug in your own numbers in the blue spaces and then begin to make your own assumptions in the green spaces in order to look at, okay, how could I manage for two or three years of a low situation. Again, hopefully you buy this insurance policy and you don't use it. For example, I bought life insurance last year. I didn't use it. That was a good thing. I think it was. Don't ask my wife, but <laughs> I think it was a good thing that I didn't use my life insurance. But I'm glad I had it simply because if something catastrophic would have happened, they would have survived. And so in some respects, you're probably looking at doing some insurance type things in order to affect that negative um, potential. So what are you guys, guys going to do here? OK, expenses. In terms of you just listened to Michael and Dustin, and they said, reduce your expenses. So. We've been running about 90%. So how far can we reduce that, those expenses? How much do you think you can pull out? Economists always like to say control expenses. It's easy to say. It's hard to do. So how much realistically do you think you could pull out on your cost of production? Think you could cut them by 5% from 90 to 85? To give a little bit of an indication, we'll put in 85 there just to uh, see uh, what happens. Certainly, if we put in 85%, it takes us from a situation where we're going to end up with a 38% debt-to-asset ratio to a 34%. And so that certainly helps some in terms of controlling expenses. The key thing is, is whether or not you can really control them to get that 90% down to 85%. And so that's one thing you can end up doing. Other decision processes you can use as a farm operator here. Other income. In terms of there's two ways that other income could end up showing up. One is for example, that would reduce the draw on family living. So for example, if uh, someone could go out and get a $30,000 job someplace, um, essentially what that would end up doing is reducing um, maybe your family living expenses from 60000 to uh, 30000 And so looking at this, and I guess we'll go back to the 90%. And so if you could either convince your family to live on half of what they normally had been living on, or if you could go get an off-farm job that would generate another 30000 in income, essentially, again, going back to the 90%, that would end up moving you again to a situation where you're going from a 38% to a 34% debt-to-asset ratio. Again, you could begin to combine those strategies, but certainly, that's one of the ways you can begin to uh, um, think, think through this um, with regards to essentially what it would end up doing is saving 30000 over the next four years, and, and so that would end up putting you in another situation. Other drivers that you may have. Isn't that 
It would be. Um, I'm kind of simplifying this um, to do that, but you are exactly correct. You, absolutely. In terms of if you're paying off your long-term debt every year, um, that would end up doing it. Um, and so it would actually make this look worse than it was kind of um, kind of kind of going in. But uh, um, from a long-term planning perspective, realize that these numbers are a little bit optimistic. Um, because you're absolutely right, your lender probably is going to want principal payment in addition to um, the interest payment. But um, at least in the uh, 1980s, a lot of producers went in and talked to their lender and just made the interest payment and were able to delay that principal payment a year. And that kind of wasn't, nobody was happy about it, but it was a livable situation. And uh, I don't know whether or not lenders will be able to do that kind of going forward, but at least if you're paying the cost of the money and not re being able to retire the principal, you might be able to do that. But you are exactly correct that um, you probably would need to be paying some principal down on that. But uh, in this case, we're, we're not doing that. Other thoughts in terms of from a management perspective? How's your equipment base? Is it all well capitalized? Could you get away with a year or two of maybe not replacing some of the equipment, kind of running your equipment a little bit longer, maybe realizing a little bit higher repair bill on that? Something you might want to look at. Again, every solution is going to be different for every operator, but to begin to think about this, instead of replacing this, maybe you just want to say, Okay, this year here, what I'm going to uh, do is I'm just going to zero out this investment, realizing I'm going to end up having to pay a little bit more in repair bills, and so my 90% might go up to 91%, but um, you can end up seeing, and again, going back to 60,000 60, there, Again, if you do it for one year, it gets you a little bit. You'd probably have to do that for two or three years. And again, I don't know whether or not you can end up doing that. You're going to have to have better repair type things. But, but again, that's one of the strategies that people think about in terms of whether or not we need to replace this um, equipment or not. In some respects, this is probably a positive of where we are because in general, I think our equipment is in pretty good shape going into this situation simply because we had some good years before we're going into the situation and I think a lot of individuals updated that that equipment but that's certainly one of the things that people are going to uh, um, need to uh, um, probably think about think about doing other thoughts Stretch some of your long-term debt. Um, the other way is maybe to go ahead and pay off a big portion of your current liabilities and get it all on long-term, such that it's a fixed interest rate, such that it is stretched out. Um, how much do we uh, want to refinance or stretch out in terms of our debt? You got a number? You can make one up, because that's what I'm doing on, on these changes. So. 100,000, and so uh, going back here and first see if I can undo my last change. And so essentially I have a situation where I'm gonna take 100,000 and refinance it. Again, it's not gonna change my long-term debt to asset ratio much but it's gonna help my working capital situation in terms of I went from a negative to a positive. Um, the thought would be is maybe instead of 100,000, maybe we'd end up uh, doing two or 300,000. The key thing is, is we're moving this from a variable interest rate to a fixed interest rate, so essentially, no matter what the incoming Trump administration does from an interest rate perspective, 
your interest rate isn't going to change. You have that fixed. Um, looking at that, you can see actually we went up there, but from a working capital perspective, um, now we're probably not going to have to go to the banker each year in order to put our next crop in. And so we're not going to have to continue to go to our short-term lender and saying, well, I need 80,000 more, I need 80,000 more, I need 80,000 more. Um, you kind of have it such that you do this once and kind of position yourself for two or three years. What happens if you're, what happens if these forecasts are wrong, you end up doing that, you end up paying maybe about a percent more on interest, maybe a percent half, a percent and a half more on interest. What happens if all of a sudden income comes in and you didn't need to do this? Can you unwind this pretty easily? Can you go ahead and pay additional long-term debt without a prepayment penalty? Yeah. And so the thing is, is this, is this is kind of your insurance policy such that if times switch, you have the ability to go ahead and pay that down ahead of time and get yourself back to a better long-term debt to asset ratio. But again, the thing is, and, and, and why I kind of use a simplified type thing um, to kind of look at the long-term as I think kind of where we are, given the income forecast, it's probably good to begin to plan for two or three years. Some individuals may find themselves into a situation where they need to sell off some fixed assets. They may need to sell machinery. Is now a good time to sell machinery? No, the used machinery market, at least all the information I have, has dropped pretty substantially. Um, it, it's very soft. What about your operation or someone's operation is in a situation where, you know, they might have to release a quarter section of land or an 80 of land. It's not a great thing. Um, my in-laws were through that. My uh, um, in-laws dad had heart surgery. Um, kind of open heart surgery, kind of bad bypass surgery in the 19, early 1970s when they were first starting to do bypass surgeries. They didn't have health insurance then, and so they ended up with a pretty big fat bill. They ended up having to sell off land in order to pay that bill in order to keep the farm going. Was that a tough psychological decision to make? Absolutely, and we still drive by that land on the way to my parents or my wife's parents' home, and that's still a psychological wound. But we're driving to the home where they're still farming. And so the thing is, they achieve their goal of keeping the farm going. And again, those are hard decisions, but the thing is, is if these forecasts are right, and if Michael's land forecasts are right, would it be better to make that hard-term decision now to sell that land, or would it be better to wait a year or two and sell that land? Knowing what you think about with regards to the prices. Yes? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Certainly, certainly you can. Yep. Yep. But again, those are hard decisions in terms of they're they're definitely hard decisions. But the thing is, is that he was talking about twenty four hundred dollars an acre. In two years, if the economy's tough, is land going to be worth $2,400 an acre? Probably not if Michael's forecasts come true. And so the thing is, it's a hard decision to make, but if you have to make it selling that 80 section to generate $2,400 today versus maybe having to sell 120 acres, at uh, 2000 or 1800 it's just one of the things I think to really think about in terms of as you position your operation um, to uh, essentially um, go, go through this. The key thing is, is there aren't really 
any easy decisions. They're all hard decisions. Um, in, in terms of um, operations will get through this. Um, I think the key thing, though, is it's very important to plan. Um, I think just planning for one year probably isn't enough at this point, given where we are and given what the expectations are. I think you probably need to be looking at two or three years making those decisions simply because running it another year or two and then finding out, oh, I need to sell land, it's going to be more painful then than it may be now simply because the amount of land in order to kind of solve the situation may be larger than it is, is now. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the afternoon session with regards to tax implications. Certainly there's tax implications. In the example that we've had, um, in terms of there is capital appreciation, and so there's some, going to be some tax management issues there um, with regards to, to looking at it. But I guess the key take-home message here is that uh, it probably will make some sense in terms of looking at this from a little longer term. And we'll hop back to the last slide. If I can run this thing. And so, again, I think it's important to look at the long-term decision um, and, and really take a look at what are some of the levers and kind of figuring out if we make this decision, is that going to be enough or am I going to have to do other things? And so certainly I think it makes sense to create and look at um, kind of what your cash flow situation is going to be next year. But also I think you want to use some type of tool to begin to look at a little longer situation such that if we have repeated years of this lower price situation, um, start thinking about what are some of those options that you may need to make and when you may want to want to pull the trigger. Any questions? I think we have a minute or two for questions. Yes. Um, the leasing figure would have been in the uh, expenses. And so, for example, um, you had your in revenue, you had your expenses. And so one of the ways, for example, you may be able to reduce that, especially if you have cash leases, um, we talked about reducing it from 90% to 85%. Well, if I'm able to negotiate a cash lease down, that would reduce some of your costs of operation. And so leasing is a, is a great thing that Michael will be talking about in a little bit. But um, certainly, that's uh, an important thing you, you can look at. If it's a crop share lease, in some respects, you may be able to try um, to negotiate a little bit with regards to who pays what and what the percentages are. But, but certainly, um, both of those would en end up affecting your, your cost of production. Good question. 